15 years since a hit that dramatically changed the lives of two young men, Michigan's Dadrian Taylor and Penn State's Bob Stevenson. Saturday on the pregame show, we will tell their story. Here's a sneak preview. 32 years of watching college football in a press box. I have never seen a hit like that. Probably as hard a hit as uh, I've been around. Initially, I can remember people in the headset saying, I think it's Woodson. I end up getting, you know, stalk blocked by Jura Vicious, so I was of no help, you know, and, and all of a sudden, I think I was unconscious for about two minutes, waking up, knowing that something was wrong because of everyone over top of me. Well, neither Stevenson nor Taylor ever played another down of football. So again, John, you were at that game, playing in that game. What do you remember about that hit? Well, you know, your initial reaction is that it's a, it's a phenomenal hit, and you're excited because of uh, the explosion and, and the, the, the momentum of the game. But then all of a sudden, you know, neither guy's getting up, neither guy's moving. You get concerned, and, and your hope is that they're just knocked out. And, uh, and you know, from our sideline, we were uh, – the hit happened on Penn State sideline, so they had a little more information. They kind of knew what was going on a little bit before we did. And um, come to find out, uh, when we did find out that he had broke his neck or a bone in his neck, um, Dadrian Taylor um, – you know, it was it was one of those things where you just kind of pause for a moment and you realize uh, what could possibly happen. Uh, and then Daydream came in a couple days later with the halo on and the screws in his head, and uh, it, it really gives you a moment of pause because you just you realize you're only one play away from never having the opportunity and the privilege of playing football again. And of course, player safety is such a huge issue right now. And I think you can make the argument that again, as sad and as tragic as it is that neither of those guys played again. In a sense, when you compare it to some of the things that are going on now, they are relatively fortunate. I mean, you know, they can still walk, they can still think, they can still talk. All of the things that, that people worry about now with dementia and long-term effects of concussions. And I guess as we kind of look at what has become a broader issue and maybe the biggest challenge facing football in this day and age, do you think, Chris, that enough is being done, the right things are being done? when we talk about player safety? Well, I think we're going in that direction. And you look at a hit like that, and it certainly tugs at your heartstrings. But I think you realize when you're a football player that you assume and accept the risk every time you put on the uniform, every time you buckle up that chin strap and go out to the field. And I think it's no different than any uniformed person that goes to work when they have inherent danger and potential risk, whether that's a police officer, a fire fireman, whether that's military, whatever it is, you don't anticipate that it would happen to you. You certainly think about it as you did, John, but you assume and you accept the risk and it's just what you do. Yeah, and you know, Having head injuries myself, I, I wouldn't go back and change anything that I did. Having you know, knowing the information that I know now, but there is concern that as you get as you age and, and these things become you know a part of your life, you have to have communication with the loved ones around you. I have communication with my wife all the time, and I say, hey, um, you know, if you see these things happening to me, this is you know the steps that we need to take. You need to be aware of this, and and you know, I, I sometimes wake up and I, if I forget something or. You know, I'm, I'm in my back of my mind, I'm thinking, is this because of football or, you know, did I just forget something? How often do you think about that? Uh, you know, I, I, a couple of times a week. I wouldn't say every day, but, uh, you know, in the job that I do now and, and especially on the sidelines, you know, if a name doesn't come to me or, uh, you know, because we do so much studying in this business, you, you really should, you know, have that recall. And, and sometimes I think, well, if I don't have that, is it because of, of some kind of brain injury that I've either sustained or, or dementia setting in? You know, it's definitely the most significant thing that we're facing in college football right now. And I, I would make a couple suggestions. I think former players more recent than me have an important role in this. I, when you listen to talk shows and, and you listen to ex-players say uh, they're ruining the game, uh, people are getting soft, that is w unbelievably counterproductive. Former players don't understand that this is the fastest, strongest generation of college athletics. So I think, I think we all play a role in, in not talking like that. The rules have to change, obviously, and, and I think they're doing a good job addressing the rules. And the last thing I would say is I am a big time proponent of uh, conferences taking over head injuries and spinal injuries at the game. We're all making enough money where a conference can hire third-party medical staffs on the sidelines 
to evaluate from the time the head injury occurs to when that player can come back. Pat, 40, you cover this game so closely on a national level. And again, you're as familiar with these stories, if not more so than most of us. What's your take on the direction this is heading? Well, I, I definitely think it's being taken more seriously. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about it, Dave, is that, you know, the NFL obviously is leading the charges in this, and it should. But the colleges have picked up the ball and are running with it. They need to. And I agree with Jerry and what he said, that there has to be an ownership of this from the conference leadership and the NCAA leadership as a whole because they are making a lot of money. And guess who isn't making money in this? The players. A lot of people looked at what happened to Marcus Lattimore, the South Carolina running back, dislocated knee, not a neck injury, not a head injury, but still the kind of thing that could jeopardize his career and said, wow, he's given a lot to South Carolina. He's gotten a scholarship in return, and that's not nothing, but is it enough? Is there going to be something enough that's done for these guys that are putting their bodies on the line for these schools? You know, Coach, I would piggyback on your thought when you looked at it, and you mentioned the rules change and making the adjustments. For me, it may go one step further than that. And I know it's going to sound like I'm out here a little bit, but maybe you change the dimensions of the field. Because when you look at it, this is the same dimensions when you see how wide the field is that they used so many decades ago when guys were physically much smaller, much slower. They didn't have that same type of impact. And you're putting it in a strike zone that's very tight. And so it's creating these catastrophic collisions. If you widen the field, and everybody knows mass is force times acceleration, I think you can slow down some of these impacts. A guy's not going to run further faster and so maybe that'll limit the impact they do do that in the cfl you know so it might be something that we can look at i think you can't leave any stone unturned i agree with what you just said I, you know it is an unusual idea but but everything should be considered yep. i mean if if, if a, a bigger field prevents one head injury one spinal cord injury then let's widen the field if we can find the evidence you two know this the culture of the coaching staff and the training staff and it's not always a good culture, and we've all been part of it on both sides of it. And that's why you need an outside expert. No, and I, 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 I agree completely because as a player, especially as a college football player, you're trying to make a name for yourself. You're trying to go out there, earn a spot for the team, earn a respect for your university family, possibly an NFL career. And, and there is so much that you put into it that for, for, for you to have to say, Coach, I can't go back in there because I hurt my head. It, it just is not something that right. a college football player is ever going to say. And to put a coach in that position, too, they don't have that doctorate. They don't have that education to know if they can go back in or not. So you need somebody who is educated, not connected with the program, to make that decision. And inconsistencies with a knee injury or a shoulder injuries, one, doctor, one medical staff at one school wants to do it this way and another medical staff wants to do it another way, it, that's all different when it comes to head injuries. There's, there's too many inconsistencies in my experience. And again, I mean, you guys are all making points on different issues that this needs to be rethought broadly. And, you know, you think about the comparison time. The comparison time of this is 1905 when yeah. the game nearly died. Yeah. And that was when the forward pass was introduced into the game. And that changed the game. And, and it allowed, you know, took away from these mass plays where guys were hurtling into the line and there, mm -hmm. was, there, there was nowhere else to go. So again, it took a huge, broad change in the game, and maybe we are talking about making a broad change again in college football and in football in general.